All right. So I've just dropped in a message and I'll uh, keep a check uh, if he faces any issues and hopefully he'll be able to join in. Uh, so, hi. Nice to meet everyone. Um, really good to see a very diverse audience uh, with all the professionals and from all the cities and countries. Um, so, my name is Muhammad Tala Mufti and uh, I'm from uh, from Pakistan. And uh, my colleague Basit, who will be joining, he's also from Pakistan. And us three, so Mr. Hassan Jafri, myself and Basit, we are all from the same architecture school. We graduated uh, uh, from the same batch of our undergraduate program in architecture. So we actually know each other, I think, for quite some time. Um, so by profession, I'm an architect. Um, and uh, I have had some experience working in the private sector um, in Pakistan, working on several different types of projects uh, as project manager and as an architect, as a designer, and also sometimes as um, in architecture visual visualization. So lots of diverse skills, uh, especially when it comes to digital tools. But then I shifted to teaching and one of my main uh, expertise in teaching and research was uh, parametric design and using digital tools to help um, improve architecture design and construction methods. So not only did I teach parametric design to undergraduate students, but I also conducted several workshops um, geared towards uh, graduates and professionals. Uh, pr practitioners from the architecture, civil, and construction industry. And um, even my research right now, I'm doing my PhD from Ghent University in Belgium. I've, uh, I've been here for the last two years uh, as part of um, a scholarship program from Pakistan. And uh, even here, my research is um, based on digital tools, but the focus of my research right now is digital tools but in developing countries uh, because these um, uh, situations can be very challenging when you want to implement some new methods some new methodologies there can be many hidden factors which can uh, uh, either prove to be uh, discouraging at times or create conflicts but also at the same time they can actually provide some very interesting opportunities so in many countries around the world where you have <clears throat> very limited access to more advanced forms of technologies in different industries and different sectors. That should not be considered as a limitation, but there needs to be a much more uh, localized uh, exploration of what is possible considering the existing situation. And I think in that context, even the project that we are going to present actually uh, is kind of an example of the same experience uh, dealing with local challenges and uh, local factors. So I'm just going to share my screen. Yeah, uh, before you share, I I would just like to introduce Basit as well to the, he, oh, he has. Yeah, he's here. Yeah. So uh, guys, the other uh, instructor today will be Sheikh Abdul Basit. And Basit, if you could just introduce yourself uh, briefly. So yeah. Hi guys, this is architect Sheikh Abdul Basit from Pakistan. Uh, me and my team uh, have executed this project here, here in Karachi. Uh, thanks to Tala Mufti, uh, he designed that complex design and uh, he executed here. Continue, please. Yes, Tala, you can now uh, continue here. Yeah. Okay, so I'm just going to share my screen. Um, and the way we designed this presentation, I'm going to be presenting the first half, which is sort of the design process and Basit will then take over kind of midway and he will explain the entire construction and coordination because I think that was a bigger challenge for this project to actually make things happen on the site. Uh, and uh, uh, I, there might be some things that we might be repeating and there are obviously some details which Basit is more familiar with regarding the background of the project. So hopefully we won't miss anything. 
<laughs> yeah, just to give you just to give you a heads up that uh, today in the morning, I gave them a brief overview of what is Rhino and Grasshopper and what are the plugins, right? Oh, so great. They, that's great. Yeah, so they just uh, have a very little <laughs> like brief introduction to these uh, tools. Perfect. Uh, yeah, feel free to ask any questions if. Um... Because you never know, there could be a glitch in the sound or some communication error. So feel free to uh, ask questions. I won't be able to see raised hands, but Hassan, maybe you can yes, jump yes, in. Yes, yes, I will I yeah. just jump in uh, when someone is asking a question. Okay. So uh, I hope my screen is visible. No, it's, uh, yeah, now it is. All right. So uh, the title of uh, the project is called uh, the brick screen and uh, the, the word big screen uh, is basically translation from uh, the Pakistani vernacular term for a jali, which is basically a perforated screen. Uh, so we kind of named this project as a, as a reference to our traditional practices. I'll kind of explain that uh, as well. Um, so this project was done by myself, Talha Mufti, and uh, Mr. Sheikh Abdul Basit. Um, so this was basically a collaborative effort which uh, started, I think, at the end of 2018 and start of 2019. So you'll also hear some pandemic stories in between uh, and even how that kind of added to the existing challenges of the project. And uh, the the site, or I would say, the client uh, for this project was the Arts Council of Pakistan in Karachi. And I think Mr. Sheikh Abdul Basit can actually give a better overview of who uh, the stakeholders are because he has been collaborating with them on several occasions and for a long period of time. And the brick screen was just uh, a smaller project out of a larger collection of projects. Uh, uh, in construction and renovation. So, so I was kind of brought in by Mr. Sheikh Abdul Basit to um, design this particular facade. Um, so this is essentially a facade renovation project uh, for the Arts Council of Pakistan, Karachi. I would like to uh, like, uh, interfere. There's, there's some gray boxes coming on top of your presentation. Uh yeah, I think that belongs to Zoom. Uh, I think those are from Zoom, I think. So if you could just minimize these, uh, uh, like the lower, like the one on the right is like disturbing us a bit more. Okay. Is it better? Yes. And you could move it to the top. Yeah, uh, that's better. Perfect. Perfect. Sorry about that. So this was uh, in Karachi and the project was actually completed in 2022. Uh, it took some time because of the pandemic. And of course, there, there, there were always some challenges uh, which are beyond your control. Uh, so this was designed by me and uh, the entire fabrication, construction, project management and coordination was done by, was led by Mr. Sheikh Abdul Basid. Um, so I just wanted to add that we also wrote a paper on this, on this uh, particular project, which goes into a lot of detail. So I, I just have a screenshot of this paper. Maybe I can, I can even share the link for the paper. It's freely available online with yeah, uh, Mr. Hassan Jaffrey and uh, he can share. So uh, basically uh, the paper also goes into a lot of detail. We presented this uh, conference paper uh, within this year. So if anything, uh, <clears throat> if you want some more uh, egg, more information or if you're interested to know more, you can actually find some references in there. Um, so let's start with the, uh, the motivation behind the project and the challenges. So uh, first of all, the state of parametric design in Pakistan. So from what I know that you all have at least... Uh, been somewhat familiar with the term parametric design, which is uh, an algorithm based technique to form design processes to create automatic design processes based on uh, functions, rules, variables and parameters. So it's more about 
creating a set of rules which control the design process rather than simply designing a building. And usually the advantage of parametric design is that you can actually achieve a lot more complex forms and uh, uh, you can actually add in a lot of functionality in terms of sustainability and efficiency, which is not possible through conventional design methods because with parametric design, you can actually combine your design knowledge with some advanced techniques or data-driven techniques. Um, and it's basically just a method. So as far as your imagination allows, you can actually do a lot more. So this project will actually show a few examples of how parametric design was used uh, to actually design, not only design this building, but also to construct this building because we wanted a seamless transition from design to construction. So the state of parametric design in Pakistan is that it's still considered a very niche topic, but I would say it parametric design is not exactly mainstream, even in more developed countries, um, even in places like UK or Belgium or USA. There's a lot more focus on BIM. Uh, I, I'm sure people who are related to the construction or civil in industry are familiar with that term. So. Building information modeling is still considered a much uh, more common industrial standard as compared to parametric design. But these terms can be changed around because even in BIM, you're basically using data from different collaborators and stakeholders to actually uh, create a building. Um, so parametric design just is more open-ended, uh, um, especially with Grasshopper and Rhino. Uh, so in Pakistan, it's considered a very niche topic. Uh, when I started teaching back in 2016 and 17, it was not a topic which was actually uh, part of all the curriculums of all the architecture or engineering schools in Pakistan. I believe that is not still the case. But at least we started teaching at an undergraduate level, and this is only a few years ago. So we expect that it will take some time before it actually uh, gains some traction and the second biggest challenge is of course the construction industry itself because when you talk about digitizing industries um, no matter what country you look at uh, the construction industry is vast it's complex because it's dealing with so many different things at the same time uh, because you have infrastructure you have buildings you have public services uh, you have all types of different scales and they're all reliant on these multi-million dollar projects and uh, vast investments in equipment and manpower. So the construction industry is always slow when it comes to digitization and more so in the case of Pakistan, where uh, even today, most of our construction techniques are pretty much um, unchanged for the last few decades. Most of our uh, methods are still manual based um, on uh, manual labor and manpower, but, but that also has to do with economic reasons. Then there are also historical factors. And by historical factors, I mean uh, that, of course, um, countries which enjoy a better access to technology, they've had rapid development because of how they experienced the industrial revolution in the 20th century how they actually experienced the dot-com bubble of the 90s uh, of the internet boom. But countries which are on the lower side of the digitization spectrum, countries like Pakistan and maybe uh, some other countries, uh, of course, I can't speak for your experience, so you, you might have a better idea of where your country or city stands in that process. But because Pakistan was never directly um, contributing to the industrial revolution, and it always lags behind in technological access. So that's always a, also a challenge when it comes to using technology to improve performance or sustainability uh, or to have uh, better construction uh, methods. Then there are also institution and bureaucratic forces, which comes into more uh, a social realm. That's also part of my research uh, because uh, sometimes you're dealing with um, different institutions, organizations, whether in the public sector and private sector, and no matter where you go, there's always um, certain 
social relations which are already kind of set and processes that you have to go through. So in order to jump in, introduce something new or to actually create a disruption that can actually be very difficult. So these factors always come into play when you're trying to do something innovative, especially when it comes to sustainability. And then, of course, there's alienation and concerns regarding technology. I, I think we're seeing uh, the same uh, kind of alienation and concerns regarding artificial intelligence and machine learning because uh, all of a sudden there are so many rapid developments and the public is still trying to form an opinion. Different experts are still trying to form an opinion whether it's beneficial or not. So it is understandable that any new technology is always met with some sort of resistance. Um, and that has to do, of course, with very valid concerns because we all understand in all industries that whenever there's a rapid change in the technological access or the de development of technology itself, that usually means that there's going to be some sort of automation, some sort of employment displacement. And of course, nobody wants to uh, sacrifice stability uh, for sake of technology. But there's always this challenge of thinking in short term versus the long term. What are we trying to sacrifice today uh, or what disruption is only temporary and which can actually result in better benefits in the long run? So that's the kind of the state of the uh, construction technology and parametric design in Pakistan. Even when it comes to parametric design, there is always this concern of how complex is go it's going to be, whether it's going to be compatible with the existing um, techniques. So when we actually decided to pursue parametric design, I, I, the, the, credit, the credit actually goes to Mr. Sheikh Abdul Basit, who approached me back in 2018 and 19, that um, he actually uh, reached an agreement with our main uh, uh, collaborators, the Art Council of Pakistan, uh, to actually pursue parametric design as part of this facade renovation project. And he actually uh, had to explain what parametric design is, what are the advantages. And of course, he can actually go into much more detail of how that process went and uh, how that conversation um, proceeded when it came to addressing all the concerns that different stakeholders has, has because that's a real world factor which is usually uh, not talked about when you actually see examples of parametric design um, in architecture journals and blogs and articles and media um, but these are always going to be concerns in any project related to construction and design um, so the main motivation for this project and for pursuing parametric design was, of course, first of all, to actually set a precedent. precedent. Because once you have uh, an actual example, a real world example, it is much easier to actually convince other stakeholders or new clients, new investor uh, investors to actually tr um, have some trust uh, in some new innovative technology. And I, I believe a lot of people here in the audience are entrepreneurs themselves. And I know that you also feel like uh, the biggest challenge is always your first implementation, your first project, because that is going to be your precedent for actually uh, creating a reputation and actually proving to other stakeholders what actually is possible. Uh, so that was one of the main motivations because we saw that in Pakistan, there was really no example of parametric design of people trying to explore this design technique using data and algorithms. Um, we had already seen some examples in other countries. So especially uh, if you actually look at Iran, a lot of architects in Iran have been doing similar stuff. And that was sort of an inspiration for us because what we saw was that the constru construction industry and the digitizing context uh, was similar between Iran and Pakistan. A lot of their construction techniques are manual as well. Uh, and they also have a lot of challenges when it comes to innovative technologies in the construction industry. So that was kind of our inspiration. And we wanted to pursue that and basically set up our own precedent in Pakistan. So not just for ourselves, but also for other architects, designers, students, young professionals, 
uh, entrepreneurs, uh, people who really want to bring a positive change in terms of sustainability to have this project as a real life proof that this is actually possible considering the local context of Pakistan. And the second motivation was that I think very early on, we decided that we want to use uh, the brick. Uh, this was done for multiple reasons. First of all, brick is kind of a celebrated regional material of Pakistan. Um, it has been used in the region since the Indus Valley civilization, uh, when you have the earliest forms of bricks. Um, and uh, because this the material is easily available it's a modular material it's easy to transport it's cheap to manufacture it's easy to assemble you don't really require uh, a lot of um, advanced equipment to actually start working with bricks you can easily train people so as far as pakistan goes brick is kind of uh, i think an evergreen material and we really wanted to bring that into the 21st century we wanted to use new techniques, but with a material which was familiar to everyone. And we really wanted to explore what was possible when it, uh, with <coughs> parametric design and bricks. And also because brick is a modular and standardized material, because every brick is the same and you already know your measurements. <coughs> so it's actually very easy to use data to actually work with bricks. So you have very discrete quantities and you can actually uh, convert bricks into data and use data to actually control bricks, which we will go into um, detail during this presentation. So we wanted to have that familiar material and we wanted to see, okay, how we can actually push this material uh, further, what is possible without changing the brick itself. Because changing the brick itself meant that we had to deal with a very rigid manufacturing process and we didn't really want to do that you have to kind of pick your battles when it comes to disrupting or innovating so we wanted to do what was possible from our end without actually changing the underlying construction systems so we wanted to use the brick as it is as it is available in the market in pakistan today but we wanted to involve a new technique in deciding how the brick is actually arranged and even in history of architecture of Pakistan, you see so many interesting examples of using brick and stone. Uh, as you can see from these images, uh, using brick not only to create surfaces and enclosures and uh, structures, but also to use it in more decorative fashion for ventilation, uh, for uh, natural insulation. And you have uh, so many examples of people using stones to create uh, bricks and stones to create perforated screens, which are uh, a really amazing passive uh, system available in Pakistan uh, because it actually controls the amount of light, the amount of heat. It allows for natural light. It allows for ventilation. So you already have all of these existing techniques that we wanted to do the same uh, with using our digital processes. And that's why we actually call this project the brick screen or the brick Jale in Urdu um, because it was a reference to a similar perforated screen that has already existed and using this sort of language which is familiar to people especially your local stakeholders who might be more familiar with the term Jali rather than the term parametric design so even that kind of helps in creating a narrative which people can share and actually create more trust between the stakeholders. Um, so our main question was that we have a very standard brick, uh, which is easily available. You can actually purchase in large quantities. So how can we use data and parametric design to improve its performance and maybe add some communicative layer? Because that was one of the goals from the clients themselves, because the building that we were working on I'm going to show some uh, pictures of the building which uh, before renovation. The building was a key structure in the entire campus of Arts Council Karanchi. It had a massive presence on the site, but they felt that in terms of communication uh, to the larger uh, audience uh, of what that place really means, because uh, the institution itself um, 
is uh, is a massive contributor to arts in Pakistan, to training of arts, to showcasing of arts and sharing uh, culture and arts of Pakistan with the larger audience of Karachi and even globally. So there was this communication aspect that we needed to deal with. Can we actually embed data-driven communication in the bricks? And of course, the third aspect was aesthetics. As a designer, we feel that you really <laughs> need to create a form that uh, not only appeals to uh, the imagination, but actually uh, adds more experiential value on the site. So we wanted to use parametric design to do all of these things with a very standard material and actually come up with a new digital data-driven brick tectonic. Uh, so basically a new way to work with bricks. So this is the, um, the site in question. On the left, you can actually see the building which we were going to uh, renovate. Uh, the facade which was going to be removed. So uh, considering that this is a major institution concerning uh, the teaching and dissemination of arts and culture in Pakistan, the building wasn't really uh, really representing that uh, role of the institution. I mean, that's pretty obvious from the image. And the clients felt that that had to be changed. Uh, and on the right is just a marker of where uh, the city and the site is. So this is uh, in situated in Karachi, which is a major coastal city in Pakistan. And we also wanted to kind of uh, refer to the coastal uh, context, uh, the fact that this is a coastal city. So we actually wanted to play with that idea in terms of aesthetics as well. So. Starting with the design process, so here are some more images. This is uh, on the left, you can actually see uh, a view from the inside right behind the uh, the facade. And you can actually see the the nature of light wasn't really that in, I mean, even in terms of experiential qualities, it was not really that interesting. And uh, we believe that by using the br brick screen method and parametric design, we could, we could actually improve upon natural ventilation and natural lighting and create a large scale uh, screen, which could actually help that in a passive manner. And by passive, we mean not to add any um, dedicated systems. Uh, so let's say electrical or energy um generation systems or using any sort of uh, sensors or any sort of uh, mechanization. So it was all simply uh, created using a conventional material um, and conventional technique. Of course, a lot could, could be done or proposed in terms of, let's say, uh, energy generation or maybe using um, maybe perhaps more advanced tools and techniques uh, but of course, the, when you have to set a precedent, you kind of have to create a more realistic vision of what kind of innovation is possible um, when you don't really have um, more local examples um, of similar technologies. So the, the project was kind of dealt with in three main phases. So the first was actually translating the existing site as accurately as possible and creating a digital twin because uh, a, a digital twin which is again a term borrowed from BIM or building information modeling that basically means that you actually create your data models and your three-dimensional models uh, trying to depict the existing situation of the building and spaces as accurately as possible uh, because that allows for much more rapid design process much more rapid prototyping and you can be very confident that whatever you're deciding or designing that can be executed on site uh, without any errors or inaccuracies and it can actually help with a lot of cost estimation a lot of efficient workflows so by the time we were done designing the project we knew exactly how many bricks that we needed uh, which is again only possible if you actually have a very precise digital twin and also because this was also important because I was working in Lahore at the time and Mr. Basit was situated in Karachi. So 
we were actually remotely working on this project even before the pandemic had started. Uh, so even for that purposes, creating a digital twin was very essential for us. And then of course was the generative design process where we used the digital twin to actually come up with different ideas for parametric design, uh, working with efficiency, communication, ex expression, aesthetics, and identity within uh, the material of brick. And the third step was actually optimizing the generative design uh, process for uh, construction on site, uh, keeping in mind that we have manual masonry techniques when it comes to assembling bricks in Pakistan. Uh, so we had to make sure that we were able to optimize whatever we were creating uh, and create an automatic process uh, going from design to construction because in the architecture and construction industry, time is money. And when it comes to construction, your main uh, uh, budgeting for time and uh, cost is oftentimes in manpower. So if you can reduce the amount of manual labor, you can actually optimize uh, the construction cost a lot. So that was one of our main concerns that we really wanted to optimize and automate that process to make sure that we not uh, we were not burdening um, the project with too many man hours when it came to construction while also trying to innovate because otherwise that would not work in our favor. We wanted to convince our stakeholders that whatever we were trying to do, whatever innovation we were trying to introduce, we were doing so in a very cost-effective and optimum manner. So for natural light and ventilation, we already had some idea of how the building was going to be renovated from the inside. We already had some uh, plans and functions from inside the building. Um, so we knew where, uh, so uh, there were going to be some studio spaces, some learning spaces inside the building. Uh, and along the side, uh, as you could see, even from the uh, older photographs, there was going to be a continuous corridor for circulation uh, towards the outer edge, right behind the facade. So keeping all those spaces in mind, we kind of came up with uh, a, a simple map for natural light and ventilation. As designers, we kind of decided, okay, what spaces or uh, parts of circulation where we wanted to actually have less lesser amount of light or more amount of light depending on what kind of spaces we had behind. So, so for example, you can actually see uh, a lot of the red blocks. They are placed right in front of the doorways for all the studio and learning spaces because we wanted those exact points to be uh, lit up as much as possible by natural light. Um, to create a more comfortable environment and same went for because it was a passive screen so um, the same mapping was used for ventilation as well um, so and we kind of um, decreased the amount of required lighting in places where there was going to be either very minute circulation very minute foot traffic or there were some sort of storage spaces or uh, spaces which didn't really require a lot of light and ventilation. So just to create a more varied experience along uh, the edge of the building. Um, so we actually started with these plans for each of the floors, and then we converted these plans into a more three-dimensional map by overlaying them on top of each other in a vertical manner and then translating the requirements to create this uh, map on top of the facade, as you can see here. <coughs> so now we have the same values reflected on the facade. Uh, and that basically gave us the starting parameters for our generative and parametric design process. So these were the, the parameters for um, the environmental efficiency that we started with. Uh, the maximum and minimum limits of what we wanted for natural light and ventilation through this perforated facade that we were going to create. And because we were dealing with parametric design, the good thing about parametric design is that data can be anything. Uh, it can be an image. 
it can be a reading from a sensor it can be a value that you decide because every data is subjective it can be some sort of a temperature value it can be some sort of a wind value uh, so why we did not rely on uh, exact values from wind and sunlight we were mostly relying on our design intuition our own design experience um, and basically using that uh, in a way that we could then combine with other forms of uh, design so at, at the same time we were trying to explore okay uh, how can we use this platform uh, to create something using techniques that we already use as designers so architects already use a lot of techniques to come up with designs and one of them is actually drawing and sketching because we as architects in Pakistan are trained to use our hands and eyes to actually come up with ideas. So sketching and drawing is an essential uh, tool. And in this project, we actually got a chance to use that same technique, uh, the art of drawing and basically use that as a data input um, in this whole process. So what we did was uh, we for the uh, now turning that uh, data of performance of ventilation and natural light into uh, a, a more aesthetic uh, and uh, tectonic experiential system, we used the same values to actually draw different patterns. So on the top, you can actually see uh, the gradient of natural light and ventilation that was based on the uh, the spaces and the functions and programs of the building. And below, you can actually see that we use the same limits to actually turn that gradient into uh, a sort of a preliminary sketch, a preliminary pattern. So all of the darker regions from the top diagram have been turned into these uh, continuous shapes uh, because we wanted to create a more uh, a fluid pattern using bricks. So that's what we did. Uh, we actually turned data into a sketch and then we use digital painting techniques to actually turn that geometric pattern into something much more fluid. Uh, the idea for doing this was actually twofold. One, we wanted to have a very smooth transition between the different openings uh, in the brick screen. And also at the same time, like I mentioned, the city was uh, uh, situated along the coast of Pakistan. and. Uh, for the identity of Karachi, we actually wanted to create a reference to the waves of the ocean. So just imagining uh, sort of these waves of liquid forming around bricks, which is actually kind of a juxtaposition because when you think about brick, it's a very rigid material. But we knew that by using parametric design and this digital painting technique, we could actually turn the idea and materiality of the brick into something much more fluid which is not possible using uh, traditional or conventional construction techniques or uh, traditional masonry te techniques and brick. Um, I mean, you can look at all the existing brick buildings. So we wanted to uh, showcase that by using this really uh, interesting technique of parametric design, we can actually do something with a very rigid material and basically challenge its own aesthetics and create something uh, very fluid uh, and just that was just to kind of play with the imagination when it came to aesthetics of the building so to create that fluid uh, aesthetics we actually turned that data diagram into uh, a pattern a geometric a two-dimensional pattern and then uh, a digital painting using sketching and uh, and of course limiting ourselves to the parameters that were already set in terms of uh, light and ventilation. And so we kind of overlaid on the facade and that was kind of our parameter for the uh, generative process. For the communicative layer, we actually uh, had conversations with uh, our clients and they, uh, of course, they, they wanted to know would it be possible to actually embed uh, some sort of uh, communication and information within the facade uh, without actually adding like some sort of signage on uh, onto the building and what we realized that the same technique which we are using to create these images and maps 
to control the facade and the movement of the brick on the building, we could actually do the same with uh, text and images because in the end, it's all just data and how we translate that data. So we use the same techniques to actually uh, create the logo and the name of the uh, the abbreviation of the the institution, which is ACP KHI, which stands for Arts Council Pakistan Karachi. And we wanted to add that in in the facade itself, uh, where the letters and the logos would actually become part of the uh, the ventilation uh, and natural light screen without actually doing um, something else. Um, and again, that was only possible because we were able to con con convert text and images into um, into code. And so at the same time, uh, this was kind of a personal touch to the project. We also wanted to um, use this opportunity in this project, considering it was a landmark project and uh, how the building stands in the campus as sort of a monument. So we actually wanted to uh, pay a tribute as well. So the portrait you actually see uh, on the top, this black and white image uh, is actually a portrait of uh, a famous Pakistani painter and artist uh, called Sadhakan Nakash, uh, uh, who was a prominent Pakistani painter and calligrapher. And he was an in inspiration for all of us because what he did during his career was something that we felt that we were also trying to do. Um, uh, Sadkan as an artist uh, in painting and calligraphy used existing techniques and existing processes of uh, painting uh, and calligraphy and he actually tried to innovate that technique and make it his own and he was able to show to the audience uh, that something uh, was possible beyond uh, the normal I would say mm -hmm. um, and even in the city of Karachi you can actually <coughs> find a lot of his notable works. So just, I think, two kilometers away from the site uh, where you have the State Bank Museum and Art Gallery in Karachi, you can actually go and see South Khan's work, which is this 61 foot long uh, mural called Treasuries of Time. And that's something that we also find interesting about South Khan's work, that his works are immense in terms of scale and complexity. Uh, like, for example, this mural, which actually shows the evolution of intellectual achievement of man, um, on the extreme left side, you have a caveman creating uh, tools of pottery and agriculture and the wheel. And on the right hand side, you have contemporary thinkers like Einstein uh, dealing with uh, the theories of relativity. And the more you kind of zoom into the painting of Saad Ken, you find even more interesting details. And that's kind of something that we were also trying to do using parametric design and brick. So we felt it was kind of a suitable gesture to actually create this large scale portrait of Saad Ken inside the brick facade uh, using this data driven technique and kind of showing to the world that by using this new technique, we can actually do something new, do something imaginative uh, with this existing medium. So uh, in case you have already seen the interface of Grasshopper, this is a very simplified version or a very simplified flowchart of the process. So we had our images <coughs> and these images, these black and white maps were created using uh, parameters of natural light and ventilation. Uh, and then they were uh, manipulated keeping aesthetic values in mind. And the third aspect of creating these images was adding a layer of communication in terms of the, the large scale portrait uh, and the branding or the, ident the visual identity of the institution. So once we had our black and white maps, we actually used the grasshopper image sampler, which actually looks at each pixel uh, and based on the grayscale value. So grayscale value means how dark each pixel is. Uh, and it basically converts every pixel into uh, a number, which is basically how digital images work. When you have, uh, when you're looking at a digital image on a screen, what's happening is uh, your computer is actually taking uh, bits of information, converting them into RGB values and creating a colored pixel. So we did the same thing in reverse. We had the image, so we used Grasshopper to turn the pixels into numbered values. Um, and that actually worked in our favor because the brick is already 
uh, a small modular um, material. So when you actually look at a brick wall or a, a screen of brick from a distance with thousands of bricks, so it's like looking at pixels. So we were able to easily relate the pixels of an image uh, with the brick in a large uh, facade. And so we kind of used uh, that process. Uh, so from Grasshopper, we were able to uh, convert the image. So zero meant uh, that the image uh, pixel is black and uh, one meant that the pixel is white. So going from each row of uh, the image of all the pixels, so you had these numbers between 0 and 1, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, uh, basically explaining how dark or light each pixel is. And then we converted to values, uh, mapped those values from 0 to 90. So we did that because what we wanted to do was to actually work with natural light and ventilation uh, and to work with a perforated screen. All we needed to do was rotate the brick in its position in clockwise or anti-clockwise manner so that uh, the more you rotate a brick perpendicular to the edge of the building, the more light was able to uh, pass through that screen. Uh, so we translated the pixels of the image into openings of the brick by mapping uh, those can values. I, uh, can I give them a, like a small uh, demonstration? Yes. So uh, if the brick is like this and all the bricks like uh, join together, so they'll block the light, right? But if you rotate it 90 degrees, then there will be space between two bricks and the light will pass. So that was uh, the theory between behind letting the light pass right yeah so, exactly thank you yeah so you can continue yeah so on paper it's very simple but you kind of do that for every break for thousands of breaks for thousands of pixels and you end up with this this fluid pattern uh of bricks literally turning into a three-dimensional image the image that we had created so all of the patterns that you could see in the image they were translated perfectly uh, into the bricks and these are 3D renders from the design and you can actually see the letters, the logo, the portrait, the fluid patterns and the opening of the bricks creating these different openings letting through um, air and light and uh, these were kind of like frozen in their place. So we actually went through several revisions uh, of this image uh, on the one you see. So this was not basically a first attempt. We actually went through several iterations where we were experimenting with different values for... Uh, we have a question uh, from yes. Uh, uh Thank you, Talha. Uh, just a question. If you could go back one slide. Yes. One slide. No, no. This one? No, no, no. The 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 one which was on uh, on digital and also on three D. Okay, okay. Uh, I believe you mean uh, this one. No, the one. Uh, uh, I, I this, this one. one. Yeah, this one. This one exactly, exactly. This one. Yes. So, uh, is the is is the one on the right side already re uh, implemented or no? Oh, it's just a 3D. Uh, I mean, at this point in the presentation, it's a 3D, but we will also show some real images as well. Okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so... Uh, because, sorry, my point is, uh, uh, you in the beginning, you have, uh, you have uh, shown all those problems and challenges that, that you have in there in Pakistan, like, uh, like the slow digitalization and... Uh, like the bureaucracy you have and in, in some yeah. other challenges as well. Don't you think that uh, this, uh, the method you have chosen is a little bit uh, uh, advanced for the stun, for the stun countries? Yes, it is actually. Uh, but I mean, uh, that was the entire challenge. And I think uh, Mr. Bassett can actually go into some detail regarding that challenge because he was on the site talking to all the stakeholders, convincing them that this was possible and that we could do it in a in a meaningful manner. And I, I think, I mean, 
up to 3D renders, sure, you can design anything you want with a computer. But the real challenge, uh, I think, for any investor or stakeholder or any industry is how do you get it built and how much it is going to cost. So I think that was kind of like a much bigger challenge of turning this into reality. And I, I mean, I don't want to give away spoilers, but we were successful in this project. Uh, and uh, that's one of the reasons why we are presenting. So we really hope that we can actually share our experience and you can actually use our uh, experience and share them and to actually uh, counter these challenges in similar manners because you're right. It's not easy considering the the bureaucratic structures, the social resistance. And of course, people are always accepting of new ideas, but up to a very certain, very limited extent. When you give them something really uh, alienating, people can actually be very defensive. And that's a very natural reaction. That's a very human and natural reaction because you want things to be predictable in the construction industry because you have so many huge investments, even in projects like this one, even in the facade of one single building that you can't cannot risk millions of dollars uh, and then in the end realize, okay, it was a waste of time and money. Uh, so you want things to be predictable. And that is also where parametric design helps because we were able to actually create very accurate estimates of where the materials were going to be, uh, and how much time was it going to take to actually construct this? How difficult what it, what was it going to be to construct this? So when you have very accurate digital twins and very precise digital models, uh, so that's actually possible. And then it's easier to convince your stakeholders to invest in the project. Uh, and I, 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 I mean, in this project, all that credit goes to Mr. Sheikh Abdul Basit because he was the one who was making sure that this project uh, was um, uh, going to be built uh, in Drelab. So here's just a 3D animated view. So you, this will give you a better idea of the openings in the brick uh, on the two facades, uh, the two facades of the building. Um, so you can actually see some traces uh, of the interior of the building through the screen. And as you move around the building, you can actually see the patterns shifting like uh, water in the ocean. Uh, so the next stage was basically optimizing the design because when you convert thousands of pixels into thousands of decimals uh, and rotations of the bricks, you want to make sure that you're not dealing with so many different complex values uh, and rotation of the brick that it takes centuries to for people for your uh, brick masons on the site assembling the bricks by hand because that's what they had to do. They had to assemble one brick by one brick by hand uh, and they had to actually look at drawings and understand how much the brick needs to be rotated before they could set it in place. So we wanted to actually reduce the complexity. Like you said, uh, uh, like, uh, like what you said, if, if you're doing something so complex, how you're going to invest... Uh, um, uh, convince everyone else that this is actually practical and possible in a country like Pakistan with very low digitization. And that's what we did. We actually sacrificed some of the complexity that we could still achieve uh, the uh, the efficiency, the aesthetics of the facade without actually making it so complex that it was actually impossible to make. So we actually uh, started decreasing the resolution of the data and the pattern. So on the left image on the top, uh, the portion of the building, you can actually see how the bricks look like if they were only changing their rotation by one degree. But problem with one degree is when you're even holding a piece of paper. And uh, if I ask you to rotate the paper by three degrees, it's going to be impossible to figure out without actually using some sort of a measuring tool. But when you do that thousands of times, it's going to take ages to actually create something. So, of course, one degree rotation was going to be impossible. Something like 30 degree, which you can see on the right hand side, was still doable because 30 degree is kind of one third of a 90 degree angle. And for a brick mason, that's still easier to visualize. That okay, 
rotate the brick by 30 degree it's still easier to do even if you have an error of let's say plus or minus 5 degree it won't really make a difference when you're looking at something from a distance but what we felt with the 30 degree increment was that we were losing a lot of that fluid motion that we were trying to create in the bricks we, you can actually see that uh, that earlier image of two dimensional patterns was more visible rather than the fluid pattern that we had created later on so we settled with an uh, increment of 15 degree because 15 degree meant that <coughs> you could actually easily tell someone to rotate a brick by 15 degree 30 degree or 45 degree or 90 um, and even then the uh, the the pattern that we would create would be fluid enough that uh, and have enough variations in the opening to create the kind of experience that we wanted and still allow the required light and air inside the build building so that was the first step was controlling that complexity of the pattern that we had created so it was actually much more feasible for construction and the second was um, an algorithm that we developed for uh, controlling noise because when you convert any digital image into data you actually get some very weird pixels and weird values so we came up with a very simple rule uh, which you can actually see below that if you have one brick alone rotated at a different angle but the brick on the top and below were following some other pattern then we would actually basically remove that brick and repeat the pattern that was another way of controlling the uh, the complexity because how uh, brick construction usually works in Pakistan is you never instruct the brick mason that you need, let's say, 20 bricks in one line. Uh, you actually give them a chal. A chal is basically a linear sequence. Uh, chal is a word, I think, which is um, might be familiar in, in your language. So chal basically means like a walk from one point to another. So how you actually construct brick construction is you only tell them the starting point and the end point of a straight line where to put your bricks so we did the same thing but vertically because all of our bricks were kind of running vertical in this pattern so we created this chal method that uh, where it would be much easier to say okay first you start with five bricks in one angle and then 10 bricks with another angle so that way you are decreasing the amount of measurement and checking that you had to do and a brick mason could easily repeat the angle that was running through the pattern and that that is also the reason why we actually removed these uh individual bricks following uh very minute values uh which you can see on the bottom left so if i had to explain the sequence of the bottom left where um d would be indigo and c would be green so i i would have to explain the pattern saying okay four bricks in D meaning one angle and then uh, another brick in another angle and then so it's a much more complex pattern but on the right hand side without losing too much complexity you only have one change throughout the vertical sequence so it's a much more simpler uh, simpler chart in uh, in computational terms this is known as noise reduction we are you kind of approximating values to make sure there are um, fewer changes in the pixels or the pattern so we kind of turned down and controlled the complexity for every part of the facade and we made sure that all the angles of the bricks were a multiple of 15 degree because that was an angle which you could actually judge from your eye and you could use um, some sort of a, a system to actually create uh, different portions of the brick screen in a much more efficient manner, which Basit will explain in more detail. Uh, so this is the ending. Uh, the, this is the end result of that pattern. So starting from the uh, the values of light and air, and then the whole process of creating into an aesthetic experience, and then adding the imagery and the text and information, and then optimizing the whole pattern to control its uh complexity so that you didn't have too many complex values uh so here in this image one 
color basically represents one rotation of the brick. Um, so the red areas you can see are actually where the bricks were simply straight. Uh, there was no rotation. So wherever we could actually see a red brick, that meant that you only had to stack up the bricks without rotating them. So it was much easier to say, okay, uh, we need four vertical sequences of bricks without any rotation. And uh, so it was much easier to execute and actually complete these uh, portions in uh, uh, in a quick amount of time. Now, coming to construction, because we have conventional uh, construction methods where uh, construction workers actually rely on uh, drawings from the architects and the engineers to actually know what needs to be constructed. So we actually came up with a second algorithm in parametric design to turn this into a conventional AutoCAD drawing because AutoCAD uh, DWG format is the standard uh, drawing format um, which is used in construction, not just in Pakistan, but around the world. Uh, so anyone who has worked in civil construction, engineering or architecture industry is familiar with a CAD drawing, a computer assisted drawing, uh, because it's very simple to read um, for anyone, for an architect, for an engineer, for a construction worker, um, for any kind of operator on the site. Uh, you can just print it, you can print multiple copies, you don't really need a computer on the site to read the values of data. So we needed a way to convert this pattern of brick into an AutoCAD drawing. But again, the problem with complexity is if I were to actually create a drawing uh, for this facade, explaining each and every rotation by hand, it would take me years. So we actually came up with a parametric design script, which actually saw all of these bricks and created the drawings for us with all the dimensions, uh, with all the notations, all the text, all the scales, and even the color coded drawings. So everything was done automatically through our parametric design script and it saved everything as a DWG file. So on the left, you can ex actually see one of the elevation drawings that we had uh, for the uh, construction teams on the site. And this was all generated directly from Crosshopper because it's a parametric tool. You can uh, basically use it to do all sorts of things. You can use it to generate uh, images using data and you, uh, uh, and you can generate forms or you can actually use some sort of 3D model and use parametric design to actually create drawings and information out of that model. So Grasshopper is not simply for creating forms but it's also for creating new forms of data. And the data we wanted was in the form of these elevation drawings where every text, every diagram you see was generated automatically. And on the right hand side, you can actually see some of these plans. So the letters A, B, C, D, they actually correspond to each of the colors. So we actually um, did both kinds of annotation just to make sure that there were no errors during construction that everyone could see easily what was being made. So it is more like uh, if you ever played with Legos or assembled some sort of IKEA furniture. So the kind of diagrams and booklets you actually, manuals you actually get with those furnitures and toys on how to actually put this together. It's readable by everyone and we wanted the same kind of experience with our drawings as well. That even though the, uh, the facade pattern is complex, the drawings need to be easily understood by anyone who's familiar or not familiar with parametric design. So that meant that we didn't really need a lot of specialized training for the construction teams to actually uh, build this. And that's something that Basit uh, had been dealing with. Uh, so I, by the uh, my last, I think, uh, part of collaboration in this project was to actually come up with an algorithm which could actually generate these drawings. So this is the final pattern that we had after all the optimization and control of complexity that we were still able to achieve some sort of fluid pattern while making sure that we had a good flow of light and air while still adding uh, all the information that we wanted in the form of uh, the portrait of Saad Ken or the logo and text of ACP uh, Karachi. And this was the entire uh, process. So starting from concept, to write down to actual CAD drawings of the project for construction. That was entirely done through 
parametric design and grasshopper and uh, I, I think it's now time that mr sheikh abdul basit jumps in and basically now the real question of how you take something like this and you turn it into something real uh, so uh, mr basit i believe you can now uh, share your you. screen uh, uh, for the insights of the design and detailed insights of the design uh, which was uh, really complex for you uh, and uh, uh, now i'm going to talk about uh, the execution part uh, which I've faced here in Karachi. Uh, let me share you my screen here. So, uh, first, uh, let me talk about the geolocation of uh, this building. Uh, here at my cursor, you can see uh, this is the building here. And uh, for an overview, I can show you that uh, the importance of the location of the building is uh, very necessary for the project because uh, we have a synth assembly building here. And uh, uh, Jimkhana, Muslim Jimkhana here, which was really uh, post-colonial, and the National Museum of Pakistan on the west. And at east, we have the uh, uh, Cantonment Board Karachi's office. So we have some significant buildings of uh, 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 in, the, in the surrounding of Arts Council of Pakistan, Karachi. So the challenge was first, uh, what should we do, uh, which is, uh, you know, uh, unique in a way that uh, that material is not used uh, in uh, all the surrounding of the buildings and its neighborhood. So um, uh, let me share you um, the slides. So uh, this is uh, the process uh, which one uh, Basik, I think you'll doing. have to reshare your screen because we we can only see Google Earth. Uh, oh, we'll, yeah. Okay. I think you have to select the presentation while sharing. Let me check again. Here. Uh, stop share and then reshare. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I'm gonna share it uh, here. Have you guys got it? Yeah, better. Okay, so uh, this is uh, the process uh, which we were practicing here uh, in Karachi. Uh, the first challenge was uh, to train the labor here. Uh, uh, because uh, these bricks are not conventional bricks. Uh, these are double-pressed bricks, uh, which was especially made uh, for this project. Uh, we have selected the soil uh, uh, from Bhawalpur and uh, uh, transport that soil to uh, uh, Hyderabad. Uh, so it will, uh, you know, uh, it took like uh, 700 kilometers uh, in a distance uh, to make a break uh, from, uh, you know, excavating uh, the soil and uh, transport it to the, uh, you know, uh, the furnace and the kilns. So uh, the, there are some steps uh, before reaching uh, the brick to the site. Uh, first step was uh, to uh, select the brick, uh, which is uh, unique in color and uh, which is, uh, you know, unique in texture, uh, which can uh, make a, a bigger picture uh, if we use it as a pixel. So uh, uh, here you can see that we have some uh, uh, practicing bricks here. Uh, in the middle image, uh, you can see we have a rotating arch or rotating uh, tower of a brick uh, laying around. Uh, and a, uh, and there's a guy with a machine uh, uh, who is, you know, making some holes uh, in, the, uh, in the bricks. So we can, uh, you know, uh, fix it uh, in the GI pipe uh, of the armature. So it will, uh, you know, take a, uh, uh, 
it will take a shape of a body. Now, uh, uh, I'm going back uh, uh, to my uh, presentation uh, after uh, I'm going to introduce to some uh, guys here. And uh, we share it with you and uh, share a screen here. And so this is Mr. Amisha, uh, the most, uh, uh, you know, the key person uh, who approved this project uh, of uh, renovating that building. Uh, he's the president of Arts Council of Pakistan. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, He's the main guy uh, who, you know, uh, uh, let uh, this project happen. So, uh, in my earliest meeting uh, with him, uh, uh, I proposed that uh, we can convert this building into an, uh, you know, uh, a gigantic uh, monument. Uh, like this, uh, because we don't have that uh, kind of parametric building in Pakistan uh, in that much bigger scale. So the first question he raised that, uh, how are you going to do it? And my response was, I don't know, because it wasn't have done, uh, wasn't been done in Pakistan before. So, but I can assure you that uh, for the, my next client, I can show him uh, the Arts Council building uh, for a reference. So it was a bit challenging for me and my team and for Talamukti as well to come up with such a design uh, which is unique to its neighborhood and its surroundings. So uh, uh, after the design was completed, we uh, uh, like, uh, took eight months to resolve the design uh, uh, that how can we make it possible uh, with the manual labor because we don't have that much resources of our machines here and we don't have the liberty of that much budget. So we have to come up with a, some uh, with some uh, a solution which is cost efficient and uh, which is uh, you know uh, uh, familiar with uh, labor here. So uh, first, uh, I took my uh, team, uh, a contractor I hired, and uh, he's a very talented contractor. Uh, let me uh, mention his name, uh, Kadir Ahmed. Uh, he's a very talented contractor here, and uh, he took uh, uh, like uh, uh, he handpicked some labor. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, brought them in Karachi from various cities of uh, Pakistan and various villages of Pakistan here. Then uh, we have a, a guy here uh, uh, presenting. Uh, let me show you my slides. And uh, is it? here is it. So uh, there is a guy, which is the, the sole duty of the guy is to make holes in the brick. And uh, before uh, this guy, there are some other labor. Uh, they were uh, uh, selecting the bricks and uh, stacking overhead uh, with uh, different textures and different colors. Uh, now, moving to the next slide, uh, this is the most difficult part uh, in the initial stages uh, that uh, we have to demolish the uh, solid walls uh, without uh, you know, uh, disturbing the, the structure of the building. So this is the labor and uh, they are demolishing the building here. We have uh, retained the armature of the uh, uh, facade and uh, removed all the unnecessary walls, all the brick masonry walls, uh, sorry, brick block masonry walls uh, in the facade. So uh, this was like uh, uh, this. Uh, we have put uh, escape holding over it and uh, 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 we have demolished all the block masonry uh, from that facade. And the uh, uh, Arts Council is a very, uh, you, uh, you know, a very happening place where uh, event goes on every day and every day. Uh, I'm, okay. I'm in a meeting, uh, so really sorry. Uh, so this is the facade, uh, which was uh, demolished uh, after that and uh, uh, you can see uh, we have used some GI pipes and uh, GI pipes of uh, here. And uh, there is a guy making another hole here. Uh, this is the fine brick. You can see the quality of that brick we have selected. Uh, after that, uh, you know, sorting, uh, we have used uh, uh, GI pipes and uh, uh, rabbit poles and uh, made some, you know, threads on the, uh, 
on the pipes. So uh, it took like five feet height of that uh, uh, pipe. So uh, a laborer can, uh, you know, uh, put that brick in the uh, hole. So moving to the next slide, uh, this is that process again. And uh, let me tell you this one. Uh, we have fixed the armature of that uh, the metal armature here uh, on the on the structure. Uh, there is a, a MS frame uh, put at the base of the uh, armature, and uh, we have assembling the pipes here. Uh, so in the next stage, you can see uh, that uh, the bricks uh, are being put in uh, into the pipes. Uh, the right bricks. Uh, are uh, put in here uh, with the zero degrees rotation and the yellow brick shown here uh, is with the 90 degrees rotation. And you can see the wooden tools we have especially designed uh, for uh, this project uh, at the, uh, uh, you know, uh, at right, ne ne right next to that uh, uh, red shared labor. Uh, we have some wooden tools here. So uh, the labor can align that breaks uh, into their uh, corresponding rotation. So every break has its place. And uh, uh, to achieve that, uh, the whole facade, uh, we have to put carefully uh, every brick on its place. Uh, sometimes we have to put down uh, a whole wall because uh, a labor didn't read a drawing or, uh, uh, you know, uh, miss uh, read something. So we have to put down that uh, wall and make it again and again and again. So uh, uh, for the first three months, my team uh, practiced uh, how to make a wall. Then after that 90 days uh, training completed, uh, we have uh, started the construction, the, the real construction on the facade. Uh, moving to the next slide, you can see uh, that uh, we have our individual marking on the bricks, uh, which was uh, uh, you know uh, uh, written before putting uh, that brick uh, uh, into the armature. Uh, so uh, there is a supervisor uh, uh, marking that uh, uh, quotes on the brick, on each brick, and uh, uh, another uh, guy uh, takes that brick and uh, places it to the uh, correspondent area of that brick. Uh, this is the first section uh, you can see here. Uh, it was completed uh, like uh, in, I guess, uh, 45 days. It took 45 days for that first uh, section to be completed. And uh, after that, uh, we will took, pay, uh, took pace, uh, the labor got used to it and uh, they, you know, they took the speed and make it uh, really fast. Uh, the last section we have completed only in seven days. So this is the first, uh, the, th the third door uh, was uh, completed uh, in uh, like, uh, Maybe if I'm not, not wrong, uh, it took like six months uh, or five months or uh, so uh, for completing that side of a section of that building uh, where you can see the logo is uh, happening and the ripples are being made. Moving to the next slide, uh, this is the process we are uh, being uh, put ropes, uh, the threads for the references and uh, use that wooden tools uh, to align that bricks. Uh, so the bricks took uh, shape and uh, uh, the wall being right in here. Uh, the assorted uh, bricks are being placed at the right uh, side of the corner here. You can see that here. And uh, 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 the labor uh, is using that process uh, blindly because they can't, uh, they can't visualize that what we're going to uh, make. Uh, because most of the labor here is uh, uh, really uh, that, uh, uh, you know, uh, spoon fed here uh, because I have to uh, uh, stand here all day long. So they cannot uh, make a mistake uh, because if they, made a mistake, I have to put that, put down that wall. So uh, after a few years, uh, after COVID, and it took some few years, and uh, we have some uh, budget cuts as well. So in uh, 2022, last year, uh, we have uh, eventually completed uh, that facade. 
and uh, I took that picture uh, from outside of the area and uh, across the road uh, while the escape only was uh, already there. Uh, uh, you can see uh, from the inside that uh, uh, at the south side of the facade, uh, you can see the ACP THI uh, on the topmost, Im topmost image and uh, the Sarkin portrait on the lower image from the inside as well. Uh, so uh, uh, in these black and white images, you can see uh, uh, the light emitting uh, uh, from the outside comes into the building, uh, 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 which allows us to use as uh, uh, minimum light as possible uh, because we are using the sunlight as much as possible uh, because uh, this is the green building. And uh, uh, here you can see that the, uh, the texture of that bricks and the light filters through that ball. And uh, uh, you cannot see the wind blow here, but uh, let me show you, uh, uh, let me uh, demonstrate how uh, that uh, wind blows work. Uh, if you put your hand in front of your mouth and close it like uh, here, like this, you can feel a warm breath on your palm. But if you uh, blow the wind like this, you can uh, feel uh, the uh, difference in temperature on your palm. So uh, even if there is uh, hot outside, like uh, 14 degrees or 38 degrees Celsius or 45 degrees Celsius, uh, there is a quite, uh, uh, you know, a change of temperature in uh, uh, inside the building, like five to six degrees or seven to eight degrees. Uh, I have felt this uh, inside the building during construction. Uh, because the wind blows from the outside, uh, it filters through that break, those uh, short apertures, and uh, it comes in uh, like uh, a cooler air. Uh, not the cool air, but a cooler one from the outside as well. So uh, 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 these uh, people are working from the outside, uh, preparing that breaks, uh, that uh, extra mortar to be removed, and uh, uh, treatment uh, of uh, uh, falling uh, uh, that residue on the brick, removing them. So uh, you can see on the right image, uh, we have some markings on the brick uh, as well. And uh, on the left side, that guy is removing that quartz uh, before handing over to the client. Uh, after we wash that facade, uh, this is the north side facade you are seeing here. Uh, after we wash that building multiple times, uh, uh, this is the facade uh, which was revealed uh, to the public and you can see that uh, uh, clearly uh, uh, there is a, a portrait of Satkan on the right side and the ripples on the left side. The concept uh, uh, here is the Satkan uh, was, uh, uh, you know, the four fathers of uh, arts in Pakistan and uh, he uh, made that ripple in the ocean of that uh, uh, arts. Uh, ocean uh, here in uh, our culture that it uh, symbolizes this uh, and we have tributed this one. On the left side facade, uh, we can see uh, the logo of uh, the Arts Council of Pakistan Karachi and the letters written in uh, the second <coughs> door, ACPKHI as here. Uh, so uh, the uh, beauty of this building is uh, when you go as far away as uh, possible, you can see uh, the image clearly because it's a pixelated one. Uh, if you are uh, uh, standing right next to it uh, with naked eye, you cannot uh, uh, you know, visualize all the things. But uh, uh, once you open your camera on your phone or uh, something, uh, you can just uh, 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 jot down that facade uh, for you. And uh, 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 these are... Uh, uh, some images that uh, on the top image, you can see uh, top right image, uh, that was the render, that was the concept image. And on the bottom one, this is the actual one. So we have successfully uh, achieved uh, what, uh, what we were visualized. And uh, I don't know, I was not sure that would uh, uh, be uh, achieved that uh, facade or that design, but uh, with the help of my team uh, and uh, the consultation, consult, uh, consultation with the law and uh, a really deep correspondence with all the uh, stakeholders, uh, we uh, uh, achieved that building in uh, like uh, two and a half years. So uh, 
the generative design of that building uh, uh, it took place like uh, uh, different challenges. So we can make it uh, as uh, uh, good as possible. Uh, and uh, uh, here you can see the responses of the people here uh, on the right most image, you can see the light filtering through uh, on the third floor of uh, uh, this building. This is the actual image. And uh, before handing it to, uh, to, uh, to the clients, uh, uh, I took that image. And you can see the image, uh, the, the sunlight filtering uh, to the building. And this is the corridor. And uh, uh, it's not like a conventional corridor. Uh, it changes its uh, shadows, its lighting all day long. Uh, so uh, uh, in that uh, building, uh, uh, you uh, won't get you know bored uh, sitting on the corridor because it changes its shapes, it changes its uh, uh, you know its uniqueness uh, uh, all day long. Uh, here you can see that uh, the same facade, the uh, the south side facade, uh, in the artificial light uh, at night. So uh, at night, uh, this building is uh, uh, become a negative one. Uh, because uh, uh, if you uh, turn on the lights, uh, the lights uh, uh, emits from the inside, and you can see it uh, at the leftmost corner here, uh, where the concert is going on, and the light on the top uh, uh, floor, at the third floor, uh, was placed here. So you can see the image in the negative one as well. Uh, this is uh, the Comic Con was held in Karachi, and uh, it was uh, you know featured in some of the newspapers. Uh, here and it was this project was well received uh, by the public and uh, uh, the architecture community here and uh, uh, no one believes that uh, we have achieved uh, this parametric facade with manual labor with uh, so much uh, uh, low budget with so much uh, uh, you know, limited uh, resources and uh, uh, we have done it we have done it uh, and uh, uh, I guess this is the last slide. Uh, yeah, this is the last slide. So um, this was our journey here. Uh, uh, sorry, I can't uh, explain it to you in uh, a very uh, detailed manner because uh, I'm not at uh, Arts Council right now. Uh, otherwise, I will uh, show it to you on that uh, same spot. But uh, eventually, we have completed this project, and uh, uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, made a uh, benchmark for other architects and for other clients and for other students uh, to visualize, to think uh, that uh, the parametric designs uh, can be uh, achieved here in Pakistan uh, with the manual labors, with the manual technology, and uh, with limited resources. And uh, uh, at, uh, at the end, I, I would like to thank Mr. Amit Shah again, the President of Arts Council, because uh, uh, in Pakistan, most people uh, have uh, the budgets uh, for the building, but they don't dare uh, to do uh, an unconventional project. Uh, this guy uh, took the doing, you know, this guy took the risk and uh, gave us uh, the budgets, they gave us uh, the opportunity to uh, build, uh, uh, you know, a monument-like building uh, here in uh, Pakistan. And it's one of a kind, if I'm not wrong, it's one of a kind of building in Pakistan and in Southeast Asia, in South Asia and subcontinent as well. So uh, uh, over to you, Talha. Uh, thank you so much, Basit. And yeah, I, I, I think I, re I really should have uh, stressed upon the fact, like, there, there was this question about how do you, um, you know, when you don't have any other precedent or any other example, so how do you convince others? I, I, I think we should be very honest in accepting that luck does play a factor. No matter how much you plan, how much you try to innovate, there's always going to be a factor of luck and randomness. And I think in this case, because the institution that we were working with was an arts institution and because the president mr Ahmed, he uh, he actually had the required training and understanding to know what kind of value can be added so i think a lot of uh, the things that 
when it comes to innovation, even even when your prime concern is sustainability, we can't ignore the fact that we have to collaborate with other people who might have their own ideas, who may belong to different cultures. So you have to keep all of those factors in mind and you have to be very strategic about the partnerships you make or the possible opportunities that you see because no matter how much you can prove that your methods or your technologies are innovative or efficient or sustainable, they still have to exist in the real world where there are a lot of social factors, institutional factors and bureaucratic factors. So considering the bureaucratic complexities of some countries, you really have to you know, find the key people um, who can actually help you and promote those ideas and even uh, figure out a, a language which is understood by everyone. So that's why we, like even during the evolution of the project. Atala, kept... I think that they also like understand the bureaucratic complexities here yeah. in Tajikistan and Tajikistan as well. Exactly. I, I think that's something that we, the, both and the I countries really share. I like to appreciate uh, uh, Basit because uh, he has done a marvelous job because it's not easy to like train the labor, you know, because they, their hand is uh, on a certain speed and they don't want to like change their ways of constructing. So it was a really big challenge that he trained them and uh, achieved what you guys wanted to achieve, right? Yes. In fact, even the, uh, the script that you saw for the drawings, that was actually in consultation with Basit. Because he understood the processes. He could imagine in advance what the construction process would be like. So he was actually informing me how the drawings should be. So I, I think without his uh, knowledge of construction and the ability to adapt, I don't think this project was possible. So Definitely. yeah, thank you, Basit. <laughs> <laughs> so any questions regarding uh, the construction method? Rush. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Turn on your camera if you <laughs> So guys be ready for Sarush. Well, um first of all thank you uh Mr. Bassett and Tala for for the wonderful presentation. Um this is indeed something new for me particularly and um the, the 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 presentation gave me something new particularly on the parametric design um which is uh which is useful and then through the own will be applied uh will be considered by us for our projects um we have got some uh great insight into the parametric design uh, well, uh, in terms of uh, of the design that you have made, in terms of, of the parametric design that you have implemented, that's wonderful. Um, uh, it's challenging, of course, but it's wonderful. Um, usually, the way how how it goes, usually the architects when design, uh, they consider the uh, windows, uh, the big big windows, and consider the shading for this. And the way you have done in the design, it's almost like a famous saying in our cases. Uh, killing uh, two birds with one shot. But in your case, you have killed uh, three birds with one shot. First, you have uh, considered the design. Uh, second, uh, you have uh, considered the economic factor. factor, And uh, you have considered the uh, the daylight uh, that comes through the, between, through the gap between the bricks. And um, and and you created the shading, which is which is wonderful. And and my congratulations for successfully implementing the projects. Um, the questions I have I have only only three questions. Uh, I suppose uh, the first questions, the first question is, um, considering the uh the uh eco friendly material, considering the impact on the climate let's say in particular in particular the co2 emissions that um that that we have discussed and we have started in this course so far um so far in my way of the break uh it has some certain amount of co2 emission carbon dioxide which is impacting the climate change to a low to some extent 
Therefore, uh, haven't you considered the alternative uh, materials? Uh, of course, the brick is, is in terms of the economic, uh, whatever Mr. Olas has pointed out, I totally agree with this. In terms of fi fi finance, it's really useful and it is, it is better to be implemented. But is there any other alternative materials that you have considered during the design or during the uh, bless you, during the implementation, let's say such as wood or any steel or any other materials that could possibly give you, of course, this impression that that that, that after completion you have made, haven't you considered it during the design stage, or could you suggest us in the future? Which kind of material, apart from the brick, we can consider? Uh, we have considered some other material as well. Uh, uh, like uh, a brick uh, that we are making here in Pakistan uh, with rice husk. Uh, the ash of that rice husk, we add it to the brick. And uh, uh, the kiln used the sugarcane residue. So it's uh, sustainable uh, for the environment as well. But uh, the production uh, is the main, uh, you know, hurdle here in Pakistan uh, because it was all in the experimentation on that stage, and uh, uh, we haven't got the, uh, that much of a production from that factory because we uh, needed forty thousand plus bricks uh, for this project, and no one can uh, deliver a sustainable material uh, which looks like a brick. Uh, which uh, has a materiality of that brick texture because uh, I have shown you earlier that that this building uh, is surrounded uh, is neighborhood uh, it's surrounded by only conventional buildings here uh, like pre victor uh, like post colonial and uh, some other uh, buildings as well uh, with concrete with uh, you know glass facades. Uh, we have, uh, you know, decided that uh, we are uh, uh, making a, an unconventional material for Karachi because uh, in Karachi, uh, we don't uh, use bricks as a building material uh, because we have a frame structure here. And uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, the, uh, the remaining area of the, uh, of the of Pakistan, like Hyderabad, in, uh, like in Punjab and in other provinces, the uh, building material uh, mostly is a load bearing material uh, aside from the cities. Uh, they make load bearing structures, uh, which uh, was built by uh, bricks and stones and other materials. But in Karachi, we don't uh, use uh, the frame, uh, we don't use uh, the load bearing materials due to the soil uh, because we have a seashore area. And uh, this building is really, uh, you know, only three kilometers away from seashore. So uh, we have that uh, load building capacity of uh, the, the building and uh, uh, in selection of the material uh, brick uh, was the only option uh, we got uh, uh, in terms of production, in terms of timely uh, delivery at site. And uh, uh, we have chosen uh, the soil from Bhavanpur because uh, if we use uh, a river soil here uh, in different, uh, uh, like uh, river indus uh, in Sen, uh, it was not sustainable for uh, the environment. We used Bahawalpur's, uh, you know, fields uh, soil, which was suitable for that brick to make. Uh, 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 we uh, wanted a, a specific texture, the pinkish, the pinkish texture uh, for the building, uh, which was only achieved uh, from that uh, Bahawalpur area soil. Well, uh, uh, if I can you. add uh, regarding that, um, like Basin mm -hmm. mentioned, the more common material in Karachi are basically concrete blocks. And at certain points in real life project, even when you're thinking about sustainability and carbon footprint, sometimes you have to pick the lesser of the two bad options. So we already know how problematic concrete can be in the long term, but at the same time, brick can be reused uh, in different manners. Uh, so, and also when it comes to actually assessing um, the sustainability factor uh, or the impact uh, of different material, we also have a lot of issues when it comes to Pakistan and that is the availability of information because the estimates for carbon footprint or life cycle estimates, they are very uh, specific to economies and regions. So let's say the standards which are developed in UK 
they're not directly ap- applicable in Pakistan because the cost of production, the availability of material, the cost of transportation, the cost of energy is uh, entirely different. So, of course, we have to also deal with the fact that we really don't have that kind of uh, information available to convince people to select one material over other. And also we have to take into account, like Mr. Basit said, we also have to take into account that if you actually talk about the broader aspects of sustainability, we also have to deal with the sustainability of practice itself. Because if we are dealing with some specialized material which requires some very specialized uh, teams for training and construction, that means for sake of, let's say, one metric of sustainability, you are actually displacing uh, maybe uh, jobs or certain uh, categories of your construction economy. So you kind of have to pick and choose. And I think what this project can actually help us in the long term is that maybe in terms of carbon footprint, maybe this project was not perfect. Of course, it had its issues. But maybe this project can, as a precedent for using technology for more sufficient, uh, efficient ways, maybe then in the next project, we can go one step further. You know, you use whatever previous example you have. We can say, okay, we have this method, which is tested and proven on site. Okay, now maybe we can also investigate different types of materials and their impact on the environment. And parametric design tools can even help in that regard in actually assessing and measuring the uh, climatic impact. So hopefully, maybe not now, but one step at a time, hopefully we will reach that point that we are able to actually tackle the more critical issues of sustainability. But like we said, our, our first challenge was even getting people to accept a more technologically innovative solution to even design and construct something, which in itself is a much uh, is, a, is an immense challenge. But our long term hope is that we can actually use this as an example for ourselves, for our colleagues, for even people in other countries to say, OK, how can we go one step beyond this? So hopefully one day we will be there. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for um, clarification on this part. Well, the second question is on um, the second question is on uh, the time. Um, yeah, I know this uh, as we are also very, very working in the construction and we totally understand how challenging it is to build such a uh, such structure. I mean, it's not difficult, but it takes off time and 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 the, the important thing is uh, whatever you've pointed out, um, Mr. Bassett, in, in, in the presentation is it took you 45 days to complete the one section at the beginning, whereas uh, it took seven days at the end to complete it. But um, maybe I have missed it. What's the total duration of implementing the project and how many years or days or months they have completed it? Uh, we have completed this project in, uh, we have started in project in like uh, 2019 and ended this project in, in 2022. So it, uh, these are like three years. Uh, but uh, if you less the COVID uh, time, the lockdown time and all the other uh, you know, restrictions, uh, 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 we can uh, easily see that uh, it took 0.5 years to complete this project because it's a live uh, building. And uh, uh, we have to, uh, you know, uh, uh, compensate of the all the issues uh, of a life build, life building because the students are uh, studying there, and uh, we have to uh, limit our, uh, you know, the noises and all the uh, the dust and all the other pollution as well, which sites and uh, and commercial sites uh, does. So uh, this was our uh, most challenging task to uh, uh, work with the uh, operational uh, environment of that building. So it took us uh, 2.5 years to complete that building and uh, to hand it over to the clients. Well, um, thank you, thank you. Um, thank you very much. And the last question, but not least, <laughs> unfortunately, um, 
if you could go back to the slides uh, where you have seen the final design, where you have shown us, where the people were standing nearby this project. Okay, let me share my slide uh, here. And, uh... This is, uh, I guess you are talking about uh, atomic bond. This one, uh, yeah. I think, uh, uh, with the, the, the two two slides before this, it, the picture where you see all the entire building in, in, in one slide. Yeah, this one, this one, this no, the, the second one. Yeah, yeah, that's fine, that's fine. Uh, um, it is indeed again, I may have folded it all, but it looks uh, amazing, um, and inspiring. Uh, so since um, uh, by background as I told, I'm a civil structural engineer. I we mainly deal with the structural part. So um, the the building that uh, the building so far you've clarified is an existing one, yeah, and there are horizontal beams that was there. And the previous one, there was only windows. Uh, but when, when applying bricks, when filling the gap with old bricks can create an additional load on the beams, um, which might have not considered or considered um, during the design stage of this building. Therefore, have you done any analysis of um, stability of these beams? I mean, can they hold the weight uh, of the load that has been put in the beams? Because so far we can see is there are columns. Yeah, they are not, the, the load beating is they're not directly going to the ground. So it's suspending in the first floor. Therefore, is there, what what is the assessment uh, is done or if it is done then what's the impact of the load additional on the beams in case if they say there's some seismic uh, effect happens or there be some other additional loads on this a anyway is there any any assessment done to these beams are these yeah. beams have enough capacity yeah we have assessed this building before uh, demolishing the facade uh, surprisingly we have the uh, you know, uh, lower the load of this building because uh, uh, it, uh, previously it was uh, uh, built in, uh, you know, uh, 1959. So uh, on that time, the blocks, uh, the concrete blocks were used uh, uh, as a size of uh, uh, one feet and, uh, sorry, uh, two feet by one point uh, uh, seven five feet. Uh, so, uh, uh, considering that uh, amount of that blocks, we have calculated the weight of uh, the uh, the demolished blocks and the, the upcoming bricks. So, uh, uh, excuse me, excuse me. There, there, there is a there is a. Uh... Okay, okay. I'm on a site, so there is a uh, you know noises from all around my, my side. Let me just uh, uh, tell them to hold for a second. Uh, just... Uh... I'm bugging in. Sorry for the interruption. Uh, so uh, I was talking about uh, the load of uh, the building. Previously, uh, the uh, concrete blocks used, uh, which was made in 1959, 58, or 57, uh, and uh, it has a more uh, you know weight than uh, the brick itself. And uh, we have removed the wall, and uh, we have uh, uh, less uh, you know reduced the weight uh, for about. Uh, like uh, 500 kgs or uh, a ton, we have reduced as a uh, load of uh, that uh, section on each sector uh, on each section, and we have uh, uh, you know uh, made a uh, seismic analysis. Uh, this building can uh, sustain 
uh, a seismic uh, uh, earthquake uh, and uh, the bricks can sustain it, uh, even 6.5 magnitude of earthquake. Uh, previously, we have felt 5.5 uh, earthquake here in Karachi, but not 6, or not 7, not 8, uh, because this is not uh, a seismic uh, active region. Uh, but we have felt tremors uh, in the previous years. But uh, uh, this building is sustainable uh, uh, in terms of uh, structure. We have uh, uh, made some analysis, we have made some reports, and uh, we have, uh, uh, you know, uh, consulted uh, from the structural engineers uh, here in Pakistan and from Islamabad, from Lahore, and from Karachi as well. And uh, after making sure that uh, the bricks and the armature of that, uh, uh, the MS armature of the uh, building sustain the earthquake and uh, even uh, the, uh, you know, uh, uh, the interference with the people because uh, the bricks uh, are on the uh, you know reachable level in the corridor and it acts like a, a screen. So people here, a student here, uh, who come here on the first time or in the second time, uh, they uh, are curious. Uh, they uh, touch that screen. They uh, try to rotate that brick. They try to pull that brick. How is it work or how is it not? So uh, uh, we have uh, made a, a specific report that uh, it can sustain uh, 120 PSI force uh, at, in at instance, uh, it can sustain it and uh, uh, it will not be affected by, uh, you know, uh, uh, human uh, interference, human push and uh, other uh, live boats as well. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Masi. Um, um... Again, um, this is really a wonderful picture. Again, I'm repeating the again and again and again. Uh, but this is indeed. And the last questions, and this is this time is the last question. Um, the last, it's not a question actually. That's a request. In the morning, we have. Uh, I mean, during the, the 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 time that we have we are spending with Mr. Hassan, we've got a lot of information, and this he has been showing us really good tools that might be very useful for our future works. And hopefully we will implement them. And this morning, particularly, we have been. Um, he's an, he introduced the, um, the 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 software that is called Ladybug on it on a bug on a bee, on a bee, and um yeah, on a bee goes over it goes so So uh, we have downloaded it and we have seen slightly. We have been going through it and it seems us very very useful particularly for the work that we do, it is very important. Therefore, uh, I was told that um, today, uh, I, I assume Mr. Talha was dealing with this and Mr. Bassett, if you could have any information, some tutorials or some information would be, would be would much appreciated if you could share with us because we are starting to- I think this question is directed to Talha. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think, I think. Yeah, yes. Because, uh, okay. Well, we actually did use uh, Honeybee. Uh, but that was uh, when we we were actually creating the digital twin. So it was the building armature without the facade or the bricks. Uh, when we were kind of double checking our calculation from the site uh, and making sure that our uh, digital model was uh, accurate enough that we could actually implement parametric design. That was a stage when we actually had to um, use uh, some basic environmental analysis but that was mostly from uh, a shading and dominant uh, wind factor uh, just to make sure uh, because one of the things was a very simple question. If we are rotating, rotating the bricks from 0 to 90, do we rotate it counterclockwise or clockwise? Because that actually changed how the light and wind was being filtered inside, especially for the fall, uh, smaller angles during uh, the daytime. So we actually kind of verified all of that. Unfortunately, I don't have the images from that. That was, I think, done in, uh, I think, very early stage when we started working on this project before we had decided on the the actual patterns. So we did it only for a preliminary study, but that was only to um, confirm our own experience and uh, intuition of the site. Because if you could share a, a screenshot of the grasshopper, uh, like the code that you generated for this, to show them that how complex it gets as you. Uh, I, I'm, 
I, I, unfortunately, that's all actually backed up and archived in the cloud. So it will take a lot of time okay. to actually, okay, okay. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I don't have the, I think I only have the screenshot in the presentation of only the drawing generator. Like even that process, even though it sounds very simple to create uh, simple drawings, but well, even I know that was the, like, a, end, I know at the back end, there are a lot of like coding done. Right. Yeah, so essentially what we, um, I'm even right now I'm doing a lot of parametric experiments, but because of their nature, I, they cannot be shared right now publicly. But with Grasshopper, after a certain time, uh, there's a, there's this term in the Grasshopper community, it's called spaghetti. Basically, when you're dealing with all the wires and all the components, after a time, it starts turning into this very complex spaghetti. And when you're dealing with large scale projects, um, even with environmental analysis, you have to be very careful about managing your entire process and kind of breaking down the whole process into chunks. So one process would be the environmental analysis, one would be the generative design, and maybe one would be the execution part of it. Uh, otherwise the code gets far too complex to even make changes because uh, with parametric and algorithmic design, even a very small error can actually have very huge consequences. So that's kind of like the potential danger of parametric design, unfortunately. And uh, you just have to make sure that all the rules, variables and functions that you have defined uh, for your process is everything, uh, everything is correct. So yeah, even uh, something simple as creating uh, patterns of break uh, or doing a very simple sunlight analysis or a heat gain analysis in Grasshopper. When you start joining these things together, it can be really intense. Um, even today, if I had to like open up the script and uh, change something, that would probably take a lot of time. But I think that's also part of the experience that because that was done 2019. If I were to do that project right now again, I think it would be far more um, manageable, much more efficient, much more complex, uh, much more uh, environmentally uh, sufficient, uh, like much more integrated with environmental models. And I think much less spaghetti. <laughs> so, um, when you start learning Grasshopper, you have to go through these learning stages to deal with all the complexities of data. But because it's a visual tool, it's easier to learn programming this way rather than creating your own softwares from scratch. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, is, is there any information, let's say tutorials or some other books or something on particularly on this tool? that you could possibly share with us? Um, personally, I always go to YouTube because I still remember when I was a student and we had to learn softwares, there was not much free information available online. You had to uh, really find information about software. But now, even when I'm like facing some problem or need a question answered, either I just go to YouTube. And surprisingly, even chat GPT is actually very interesting in this scenario. So even if you just want uh, an explanation or an idea of which components to use and, and in what way, uh, chat GPT is actually really good in doing that. Um, so if you want to have some question answered, okay, what specifically do I need to learn in Grasshopper? And then you can kind of go through YouTube. I mean, I even started using Honeybee after going through YouTube tutorials. I have my own tutorials as well, uploaded on YouTube uh, from my last workshop, which covers the basics of Grasshopper. Um, and it was <clears throat> uh, designed to be completed in two weeks. Unfortunately, it's all in Urdu, um, but it's available on YouTube. And similarly, there are a lot of really great tutorials available online. So I, 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 I can't really mention any specifics uh but um if i have to go for let's say more premium tutorials 
my always choice is uh, Linda. Any tutorials by Linda experts, uh, even for environmental analysis and Grasshopper, uh, they are really up to date, really in depth. If you can actually get them. Well, um, thank you. Um, and um, is it possible um, if you could share with us first the presentation and the AutoCAD DWG drawings of that? uh parametric design if you have uh, that you have converted to dwg as you clarified in the presentation if we can do this we would much appreciate and this was my last question thank you and again my congratulations for the successful implementing this great project um i'll i'll have i think we'll have to consult uh first before we can actually share the actual drawings but what I'll do is I'll share some links of the tutorials, like I mentioned with Mr. Hassan, uh, the paper of the project and also the presentation. So uh, regarding the actual drawings, uh, I think we'll have to first discuss it amongst ourselves. Yeah, I think you'll need the permission okay. from the council as well. Thank you. Because it's there. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. what but we... The, the, the actual property of the Yeah, but uh, the way we... Uh, you, also, the main reason for writing the paper and going into all that detail was also so that that knowledge can be transferred without actually affecting the proprietary uh, uh, information of the client. So we basically explained the whole process from design to construction and everything. And I think combined with some tutorials. So, for example, the, the brick generation pattern, it's actually a very basic technique in Grasshopper. It's like used... Um, multiple times it's basically just called uh, you have two ways of uh, generating similar patterns one is called uh, attractor based systems uh, where you can actually pinpoint different forces and actually create patterns out of that uh, or the, the, the second process is basically image sampling which we did where we generated the first uh, uh, images um, and then we used that image as an input in grasshopper and there's only one basic component in Grasshopper called, uh, I think it's called image sampler. And when you basically run an image through it, it basically gives you a whole grid of numbers. And then you can use use that numbers to do whatever you want to either move materials or create facades or create patterns in any way you want. Uh, so those are the two main techniques which are used to create similar patterns. So like I said, in this project, creating the pattern was not really that much of an issue, but to create it, while being compatible with construction and actually getting it built, that was actually the main challenge of this project. Because up till the 3D renders, I think that anyone can do within a month of learning Grasshopper. Well, uh, thank you. No more questions, if there's any questions. Yeah, anyone else? Uh, I think Shafi wants to ask some questions. Assalamu uh, alaikum. Uh, sir, uh, this was uh, really an interesting project that you people have uh, worked on. Uh, my, I have two questions. Uh, first is uh, regarding the energy efficiency of the building. Uh, we saw that the facade was previously uh, a closed wall, including windows. Uh, there was, uh, I mean, it was a closed uh, wall. So now it's more or uh, less like an open wall with gaps in between and so that the air circulates and the ventilation and all other things that happen. So how do you compare the energy efficiency of this building with the uh, old one that existed previously? Is it more efficient uh, in terms of uh, its energy needs and energy demands? Or uh, is it, if, if, if we have improved the energy efficiency of this building, uh, then how, in, how, in what ways we have uh, improved its uh, efficiency? My second question is regarding the uh, rain, uh, as Karachi is located near to the sea, uh, I think. So uh, there must be having uh, more precipitation or rain in Karachi. So how is this uh, wall going to perform under uh, in rainy seasons? Have you done this, considered this as well in your uh, analysis and design? Thank you for asking a very uh, genuine question, because uh, this is the interesting one. Uh, we have faced uh, uh, that uh, challenge uh, during the construction. We haven't think that before uh, about rain, uh, but about wind, it's a very sustainable one. Uh, uh, we have installed some curtains inside of the building that uh, whenever uh, uh, it's about to rain, uh, there is a stop uh, 
uh, coming uh, into effect and uh, they lowered that curtains, the PVC curtains inside the building. So the rain uh, will not uh, go directly into the building. Uh, even though uh, uh, the direct rain uh, does not cause uh, any trouble to the building, but uh, when uh, the rain with the wind uh, is the more uh, troubling factor for this one. So uh, we have installed some PVC curtains, which is uh, uh, hide in uh, you know uh, on the uh, uh, slab uh, level, uh, like uh, uh, plus uh, eleven feet from the ground. And uh, whenever it's about to rain, we uh, just saw the uh, just see the forecast, and uh, there is a specific team come into this effect and uh, for that curtain for a certain amount of time and after the uh, rain finished and uh, the curtain was all uh, again uh, upwards. So uh, about uh, uh, the sustainability of that building, the environmental sustainability of the building, uh, it, uh, let me proudly, uh, proudly say it, that uh, there is uh, no uh, air conditioner in the building right now. Previously, there was uh, a lot of them, but uh, due to the wind, uh, this uh, wind blowing factor, uh, we don't have even a single AC uh, in this building right now. But uh, for the studios on the third floor, we are placing, uh, you know, uh, seven to eight uh, ACs uh, because uh, they are our sound uh, engineering uh, studio and the jamming st st uh, studio, which needs noise cancelling as, as well. That's why we are going to install a few more ACs on uh, only but on the third floor, not uh, uh, on the whole building. So uh, uh, in the running cost uh, in the energy, uh, in terms of energy, the running cost of building is uh, compared to way much less uh, uh, compared to the previous facade. Because previously it was closed uh, with the windows and uh, you have to put ACs and you have to put artificial uh, cooling system in the building. But right now uh, there is a wind uh, here and uh, we don't have snow here. So we uh, have a moderate climate all over uh, the, the, the season, uh, except for two to three, uh, two months ex uh, uh, mostly two months uh, for winter, where they close the windows of interior studios. We have placed windows and ventilators into the interior side of the uh, corridor. Uh, so the corridor has two sides. One side has a brick facade, and other side has the, uh, you know, uh, all o'clock wall and uh, some windows. <laughs> so uh, in winter, they close the windows, but in summer, uh, we use that, uh, uh, you know, the, the flow of that wind uh, we, we call it a uh, tunnel effect because there are some courtyard on, on either side of the building. So uh, there is a courtyard effect uh, uh, happen place and uh, we have a tunnel effect from that building uh, because uh, the wind uh, filters through that bricks, uh, it gets cooler. Thank you. <clears throat> and any other special reason for using MS pipes for the uh, brick work? <clears throat> you could have used... MS pipes only for holding that brick uh, because uh, if we stack uh, the brick, uh, 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 it gets destroyed uh, because it, it doesn't have any strength uh, because the, the brick is a modular uh, you know, uh, element uh, which is you know combined uh, with uh, mortar. So uh, if you place it uh, on a single column, uh, it doesn't uh, you know hold itself. So that's why we have to put uh, uh, the MS pipes, uh, the galvanized MS pipes. Uh, these are galvanized irons, uh, which are coated and uh, uh, to the, we have a uh, you know, uh, sea blown wind here in Karachi. So we have to put some chemicals over here. So uh, we have to prevent the rust uh, making uh, in between the bricks. So uh, we have used armature, uh, the uh, bottom armature and the upper armature throughout uh, the sections. And uh, we have uh, installed that pipes in that uh, armature after by putting that bricks and uh, now tools. And uh, after uh, completing that uh, top uh, three layers of that bricks, the pipe uh, uh, doesn't even, uh, you know, uh, visible from the outside or in the inside. But it's all uh, uh, completely, uh, completely, uh, you know, uh, undergoes uh, in the brick and it doesn't visible. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. 
Uh, okay, okay. At first, uh, I want to appreciate your works. They were so very interesting and also appreciable. I have seen a lot of designs like this, the concepts like this, uh, and the uh, social media and the, and the print Pinterest. But uh, also, I would like to say, changing these concepts and uh, as such an art and picture to uh, using just a break and the site is totally appreciatable uh, just using with local mm, labor. And also I had uh, just some questions. Uh, I think a lot of them were asked by Soroj and every time Soroj was asking us a question, I was tick marking in my notebook. Just, uh, I think one main question uh, have remained uh, and uh, Mr. Talha, I think I uh, can answer this. Uh, would you think that uh, the program called Revit would be suitable for such designs like this? Uh, can you use that instead of, uh, for example, Grasshopper in our projects? Uh, ab absolutely. I mean, uh, like I said in the beginning, the words like parametric, BIM, I mean, they kind of mean the same things. Basically, they mean adaptive data-driven modeling. Uh, and uh, I mean, even now, the current versions of Revit, they even have special connectors and plugins to use Grasshopper uh, inside Revit. So you can actually combine both now. Uh, so you don't even need to stick to one software. Also, in the end, uh, I've worked with several softwares. I've worked with Rhino, Blender, I, I think my first 10 years uh, was spent in uh, 3D Studio Max, which really didn't have any parametric capabilities, but still could you could actually explore a lot of stuff. Uh, I've worked with SketchUp. I've used a lot of different tools. In the end, the tool is nothing more than a guide to help you, whatever software you use. Every software has its capabilities, its strengths, its weaknesses. In some instances, Revit would be a much more capable choice. In the context of Pakistan, Revit is often discouraged. Uh, I mean, at least for now, but I hope things will change. Because to have a very good uh, Revit model, you need to have uh, all the contractors, sub-vendors, um, all the experts who are dealing with different systems of a building they also need to be using Revit. That's the only way you can actually create uh, efficient BIM models where information is kept up to date and exchanged easily. Uh, unfortunately, in Pakistan, uh, people use CAD drawings in a very manual manner. So like they literally draw inside DWG files, uh, like uh, they directly draw, they don't even use the, the parametric functions of AutoCAD or any uh, advanced functions of AutoCAD, they, they're using it only as a design tool. Uh, but when you have people using different kind of softwares, then it's very difficult to implement everything into Revit. Then you are basically increasing your own workload. But um, also my belief is that you really have to um, feel what you are comfortable with. Um, because when it comes to exploring design or working or managing construction with lots of complex information, you kind of need a software that you are very comfortable working with. That way you can kind of push it to its limit because as I soon as like you- to, I would yes. like to add to the last uh, comment that uh, I think it's very important to understand that uh, you as a designer should be in control of the software rather than it controlling you, right? Yes. Perfect. Yes, that's absolutely right. So I use Grasshopper for a lot of different things, even when I have to make something simple. It's only because I've used Grasshopper and taught Grasshopper for so long that I can literally imagine scripts in my head. Uh, yeah. Like uh, that's just how I think computationally now. And it encouraged me to learn Python as well which I'm slowly bringing back into my design workflow. So right now what I do is sometimes I don't even use Grasshopper components. I write in some Python code to do some basic functions. So it's all about how you want to keep learning, how you want to keep exploring, and then you pick and choose your tools. But 
don't limit yourself to one tool uh, as well uh, because every tool has something unique to offer. And the good thing about parametric design as a methodology is that you can combine everything as an input, as an output. You can connect Grasshopper to Revit in multiple ways. You can connect Grasshopper to SketchUp, to anything else. Like even in our project, what we did was in the end, we generated AutoCAD drawings straight from Grasshopper um, because that's a tool that is used by everyone else. So uh, I, I, I think my preference for Grasshopper is simply because I feel comfortable in it and because I know enough that I can then use it in very flexible manners. And you can probably uh, do that with maybe Revit better than me if you're familiar with it. So the, it's only a tool in the end. Got it. Got it. Thanks a lot. And uh, also, I will be very happy if you share the presentation and your personal contact detail, maybe LinkedIn, uh, you, Mr. Talha, and also Sheikh Abdul Wasit. I'll be very happy and glad. Thanks a lot. In the of end, course. I would like to thank you, uh, Talha, for taking out the time in, from your precious time and giving us the time to have an hands-on experience on your project. So thanks a lot. And I think uh, he deserves a round of applause. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for inviting us here. And uh, I, 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 we, uh, me and Basit, we graduated at the same time, like with you, Hassan, basically we graduated from the same class. But I think after graduation, Basit was just pretty much working in Karachi. I was working in Lahore. We didn't yeah. even imagine collaborating. I don't think we were even in contact before this project happened. And I still remember out of nowhere, I was actually on a train. And I got a call from Basit and he was like, I'm coming to Lahore. I need to meet you. I have an interesting idea. And by at that time, I was... I was already teaching parametric design, so I was already an expert, but I didn't really have a real world experience, maybe like maybe some small scale models. Uh, I, and I had done some um, some real world stuff at uh, Arduino I, I, I programming to actually create uh, interactive elements, uh, but only for like a public some installation. Uh, forms and models, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, we actually did... Uh, did create some very small prototypes of using the same kind of parametric language, but with actual sensors and uh, servo motors. So instead of like a, like a fixed facade, you would actually have like movable elements. But I think to do that in a real world project, that would be even more challenging. So anyways, I, I think it, some things just happen because of luck <laughs> because of random encounters and you just have to be ready to take your chances so uh, I, I, I think I mean without Basit this project would have never kicked off uh, or even think, seen completion uh, Basit I think you got disconnected and uh, special thanks to you as well for taking out the time and giving us a hands on experience of, from your project and a round of applause for Basit as well, right? Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, uh, from here. Yeah. I can take a group picture. Everyone smile. Yeah, taken from the screenshot. Yeah. Yes, yes. That will be five dollars. <laughs> so I think uh, we can uh, end this meeting. Yeah. Is there anyone else who wants to like ask anything from them? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Tala. Thank you, uh, Basit. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice day, everyone. Thank you for good luck. Time. You too, and good luck for your PhD. Thank okay. you.
Goodbye. Goodbye.